I am so sorry, everybody, for the delay here. We've had an absolutely terrible time trying to get uh, Peter Lloyd on. And I'm yes, I'm absolutely going to blame Peter. It had nothing to do with me at all. Peter's the one who can't seem to uh, connect to this call. Peter, if you're out there, I know you are. Call in. Let's try and get this hangout started. Um, it is called Suck It Up Buttercup, so whether I can get Peter Lloyd or not, I'm going to Suck It Up Buttercup. I have with me the managing editor of A Voice for Men, Dean Esme, and he is going to chat with me about Peter's very wonderful book, and we're going to hope that we can get Peter in on this call. Dean Esme, how are you? Thank you for joining me. That's right. We're sorry, everybody. Janet called me in with her technical issues, and I thought she was just being a dumb blonde girl. But it turns out, no, there's something else wrong. So we're trying our best to get Peter. And in the meantime, I haven't had a chance to read Peter Lloyd's book. Um, I've seen a chapter of it. I've, I've read all of his columns on the Daily Mail. We've printed some of his stuff. I'm still trying to get him invited in here. And if we get lucky, he's going to show up. If not, we'll have him on another time. Um, what was cool about Peter's book? Okay, here's I, I absolutely love the way um, Peter writes. He's just he's so plain and forceful and he's lighthearted about subjects that aren't lighthearted at all. Let me read you one of the first paragraphs in his book. Yes, there are advantages to being male. We can have as much sex as we like without being called slags. We rarely have to worry about being groped on a packed bus or the making the Sophie's choice between kid and career. We also have our own issues of everyday sexism. Denied parental rights, left to die years earlier than women because the National Health Service, National Health Service spending favors women. And as, um, <clears throat> sorry, he says, the National Health Care Service spending favors women, sorry. Here's this beautiful, clear, plain, wonderful writing, and I'm just choking all over it and screwing it up. Okay, we are casually packed off to war like mules. None of this shit is A, power, B, privilege, or C, easy. Like, he just comes right out of the starting gate throwing down the gauntlet. Like, sure, okay, women have issues. Guess what? Men have issues too, and a lot of them involve men dying. They're very, very serious issues. Yeah? I, yep, okay. Um, sorry, I am not being the most professional right I now. I know, we're so, <laughs> we're so unprepared for this. We need Peter, we need Peter. Um, one of my favorite things about, did you find him? Yeah. No, I think we're probably going to wind up rescheduling him. Sorry, everybody. But that's all right. So I did hear you just say something about his book, which was that it's uh, that it's uh, it's uh, wise and it's funny and it takes on some really really serious issues, but it doesn't do it in like a preachy or sanctimonious way, and it absolutely does not um, cast men's issues as something that men caused themselves. Whenever you see people talk about men's issues in the mainstream media, it's, it almost always will be followed with, oh, but patriarchy caused all these problems. You know, men screwed themselves. And that's just really, first of all, it's not true, and second of all, it's not particularly helpful. It doesn't move the dialogue any further along. We have some real issues. Women have issues. Men have issues. Everybody has issues, and some of these are institutionally caused problems, and we can deal with them. Mocking and just dismissing the issues of half of humanity doesn't help. Now, that's a pretty serious, a pretty serious accusation, a pretty serious issue, like problem that we need to solve. But Peter goes through like 350 pages where he can discuss the most. <laughs> I couldn't even read his chapter on circumcision because I just find that so horrifying. It, it just, I can't read it. It bothers me. I don't need a trigger warning and I'm not going to get PTSD. I just know it upsets me and I'm an adult and I can just decide, hey, I'm not going to read that. But that's a very, very serious issue. Um, 
I like the way he took on lad mags. Lad mags are like the magazines that feature scantily clad women. And there was this whole campaign in England about banning the lad mags because it's corrupting the youth or, or whatever. Basically, it's just women attempting to police male sexuality. And one line that really jumped out at me in Peter's book is this. Women don't own sex. I think that's such a radical statement to make because we really do assume that, don't we? We assume that women own sex, that men will do everything to get that sex from women and that women control access to this resource. And it's it's kind of a grotesque way of looking at it. I just I really loved that line. I thought it was a great, a really great chapter, his whole chapter on the lad bags. And another really interesting thing is he talks to women who both produce the photos, they they make them, they're on the set, they're the photographers, they're the lighters, they're the makeup artists, and then the women who are actually doing it. And you know, women will just throw themselves at producers to get in these magazines. It's so helpful to their own career. And both these groups of women, the, the producers and the stars, both of them were talking about how it's other women who treat them terribly. It's not men. The sexism, the bigotry, the hate, face, it comes from other women. Hey, Janet, let me, let me uh, Peter is not going to be able to join us, it looks like. If you're very lucky, he will, but we're going to try rescheduling him to talk to you. In the meantime, I'm going to ask you about his book. One, okay. of, the first, one of the first things that you said, you mentioned the National Health Service. Um, your average American is probably clueless as to what that is. I don't know about your average Canadian or Australian, but that's a specific reference to how the UK does their health system. They don't use private insurance. Well, they do, but basically most people start with the national health system. And that was a tip-off to me that made me wonder, is this mostly a British, and then you mentioned the lad mags, which was also a British controversy. Would you say that this book is mostly of interest to a British audience, or does it translate to Canada, the U.S., other countries? What, what do you think about that? It translates absolutely, and while I unfortunately just grabbed two British examples, he actually gives examples from all over the world, um, lots of examples from the States, and the basic issues are the same in all Western countries. I mean, healthcare, whether it's funded by the state or whether it's funded through private insurance, you still have four times the funding going into women's cancers than you have in men's cancers, so it doesn't seem to matter whether where that money comes from the prejudice is against men and towards women whether you're paying for your own health care or you're not well everyone pays for their own health care it's just a matter of how it's administered so i think absolutely um, this book is universal across all western democracies and maybe even further than that maybe even issues um, not as in English-speaking Western democracies, but I'll bet the situation is exactly the same in Germany and Italy and Spain. It's it's def it's not it's not something that only British people would care about or be concerned about. All right, I know there was a campaign against the so-called lad mags, which is basically almost a British version of uh... men's health or Maxim. Maxim is more like it. Um, um, and of course, this is all for straight men. Uh, I understand that uh, Peter is gay, um, openly so. Um, like, oh, I just outed him. No, not at all. Um, do, do, does he, um, in his book, and this is a, this would be more fair for him, but does that gay perspective inform his book at all? Do you think, or is that just like not even on the radar in his writing? Um, for the most part, it's not even on the radar that he's talking as a man. On his chapter um, about sexuality and how women attempt to police male sexuality, he does talk about how gay male sexuality has men are much gay men are much more free to express their sexuality, um, and they're not thought of as as you know being misogynist or their sexuality is not cast as bad because it doesn't involve women that gay men are not trying to appeal to women as sexual beings. Therefore, they're free to express their sexuality outside of women policing it. It gives them a certain 
uh, freedom that heterosexual men don't have, where women really will attempt to police your sexuality. Things like, oh, you go to strip clubs, that's just, you're objectifying women, that's just disgusting, you're a misogynist, you look at women as meat, but gay men going to gay strip clubs don't get the same accusations. Nobody comes up to them and says, oh, you're just, you guys hate men and you treat men like meat and this is just filthy and disgusting, because it doesn't involve women in any way. So outside of that, though, I don't think Peter's sexual orientation comes into it at all. He's writing as a man who's taking pride in being a man. And it's not just a matter of pride. It's feeling like you can respect your masculinity. Matt, I love where he says fucking up is a human trait. He's not out there saying, oh, he does say men are brilliant, but the argument is not every man everywhere at all times is just a wonderful guy. There are fucking dicks out there. Sure there are. Just like there are there bitches out there. That fucking up, people who are mean, people who do stupid things, it's a human trait. It's not a male defect. And that's where he's writing from. So, yeah, I don't think that his, uh, his sexual orientation plays into the book in any meaningful way. He's just a guy. He's writing as a guy. And, and I found a lot of gay guys are like that. I don't want to make this all about that. I, I actually have a suspicion. I actually can't prove it, but I have a suspicion that gay men, because there's a few gay men around the men's movement, and almost invariably, it's like they get it a little faster than your average blue pill straight guy does. Um, and I have a suspicion that's because they watch men and women interact, and they have no dog in the hunt, so they can just see how it works and watch how it works. I, I wanted to ask Peter that question myself, but uh, never mind. I, but I, I think it gives them an objectivity, and it also says something very powerful to me, um, that he would still have that compassion. That tells me that men do have compassion, despite the myth that they don't. Men do and can have compassion for their fellow men. Um, what what comes out in his book when it comes to the subject of feminism? Well, we can start. I learned today on A Voice for Men that he did not coin these particular terms, but certainly he is the first person to introduce them to me, and he refers to radical feminists as Gal Qaeda and she hadists. Um, on the whole, I don't think Peter is super overly critical of anyone other than the, the extreme radical feminists who are deliberately attempting to prevent men from achieving any rights or any equality. You're sort of run-of-the-mill, I read the dictionary on the street feminist, the kind of feminist that I interact with on, on Twitter and they usually run away crying. He doesn't really go after those ones. He is going after the specifically radical, harmful ones. And he's, again, more interested in what the actions are and not the theory. He's not spending a lot of time talking about what feminists think. He'll, he'll sometimes drop in, here's what a feminist said or here's what the opposition was. But he's mostly talking, it's a very solutions-oriented book. For example, when he's talking about the, the fraud of the rings, which I just think was what a great title for a chapter, the fraud of the rings, he's talking about marriage. And at least half that chapter is solutions-oriented. This is the way things are. This is what can happen. What can we do about it? And that's also what makes the book so refreshing. I mean, I had he has a bunch of suggestions that I myself don't fully understand, and I was hoping I could talk to him about those things so he could explain um, exactly what his recommendations are. And, you know, I think, I really think it's such a great book that we should try and reschedule this, possibly even for tomorrow if Peter's available and he's around. I don't have any problem with doing that. I just wanted to make sure we, uh, you know, guys, when we promise you a hangout, we need to do the best to at least come on the air. Um, I've already proposed to Peter that he come back, so what we should do is try to get him back and figure out what these technical issues were that caused all this in the first place. Um, uh, I'll ask you a couple more quick questions about his book, Janet, um, just to be sure. 
uh, we have the gist of it. This is not necessarily a men's rights oriented book per se, right? It's just about basically being a guy and why being a guy is cool and what's tough about being a guy. Would that be the short summation or a fair summation? Um, I think I think it's it's very much a men's rights book because he's really focusing on legal and and practical rights that men do not have. For example, parenthood. I mean, that's right in his introduction, right? Um, they don't have, men don't have parental rights. So, so a lot a of the lot solutions of to the issues that he's talking about have to do with changing laws. Like, for example, he, he writes about how men actually were forced to pay women um, alimony, essentially, just for simply getting engaged to them. I mean, that's, that's just insanity. Men need their wife's written permission to get a vasectomy. I mean, that is just craziness. So one of those things is legal. The, a court of law found a man responsible for a woman simply because he became engaged in him. One of them is not legal. There's no law that says you need your, you know, your wife's, your mommy wife's permission to make decisions about your own body, that's simply the way it is in practice. And I find a lot of the issues that we deal with in men's rights are like that. Some of them are actual legal problems. We need to get in front of the Supreme Court. We need to argue about this. We need shared parenting, that kind of stuff. But there's also a lot of things that are simply practice. It's just the way our culture is. And both of those things are important in men's rights. I don't believe that Peter ever uses the word men's rights, but perhaps simply because I'm I'm so involved and and because I know I know a decent amount about it. I certainly don't know everything. I'm learning every single day new things. Um, but I would say it, it, it is about being a guy. It's about celebrating being a guy, but it's about doing it in a way that questions and challenges the sexism that men face both in the law and in society. It's it's just such a beautifully written, accessible fun book to read and you don't expect that, right? We're going to talk about how men die earlier and die viciously and have their body parts cut off and it's going to be fun, but it actually is. His writing is just so, it, I think it's a very typical British kind of thing that there's a lot of self-deprecation and there's a lot of sarcasm and he just turns, he's not making light of the subject, he's just talking about it in a light-hearted, extremely attractive way. Um, let's go about five more minutes and we'll close this out and then we'll see about rescheduling Peter as soon as possible. I want to do a shout out to a, a couple of comments that were amusing. Uh, somebody says that you look like you just stepped out of Skyrim. That's pretty cool. I agree. Um, Ticklish Quill, another one of our gay supporters. Hi, uh, Isaac says feminists are hypocrites when it comes to sexuality, and they really, really hate us poofs because they can't put the control. That's pretty funny, but he's not the only gay man I've had uh, make that kind of observation. Um, please get Mr. Lloyd on the show, Mr. Was up. We're doing our best, brother. Okay, um, it's tech technical issues apparently on Peter's and um, and. Isaac also suggests I need a blow dry and some heavy moose. Bite me, gay man. Um, <laughs> uh, and Karen McFly he says that uh, she grew up in Germany. She's German, and but being German, she could still relate to everything in the book. He says his only. She says her only criticism of Peter's book is that he sometimes conflates women with feminists. And he's a little too worried about offending feminists, but then Brits never want to offend anyone. There is that. Um, you know what? Uh, so I actually think, Janet, that some that some people miss this, I, and I think you'd agree with me. Feminism isn't the only problem. They're just the easiest ones to pick out. Um, I think looking at women the way they really are toward men is the bigger challenge, and it sounds like Peter's trying to do that in his book, doesn't, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you that, that feminists are not the only problem. It's the feminists who are attempting to institutionalize a lot of the sexism against men because it benefits it benefits women and sexism against men has benefited women for a really really long time there's a certain irony about claiming a movement that stands for equality that what we're interested is 
in is equality and then fighting tooth and nail to make sure that men are held, forced into their specific gender roles where they must continue to support women. It's still he for she. Domestic violence is still men against women. They're just throwing, they're throwing men under the bus. There is a very much bigger, bigger, larger culture change that needs to happen where we genuinely start to look at men as fully human. And that means, means you know, a lot of men are going to be just guys, just guys, just like a lot of women are just women. We do meet the stereotypes because there, there is a certain psychology. I'm sorry, I'm a believer in evolutionary psychology. I think body dimorphism demonstrates the evidence for evolutionary psychology. Our bodies evolved so differently. It's absurd not to think that there was psychological implications behind that development. Um, but even so, it, it's really, it's feminism is allowing women to expand their roles, but they're still holding men into this very tight, tight, narrow set of expectations. And I'm sorry, it's follow the money. Why are they doing that? Because they need the money. They want your money. It's either coming as a taxpayer or it's coming as a partner. And it's really that simple. The first thing we have to do is take on this huge cultural narrative, this ideology that says men are bad and women are good. And Peter is doing just that by saying men are brilliant. Stand by your manhood. Stand by your manhood is the title of the book. Uh, we promise you all a show. We'll wrap it up for here, but we're going to do our best to figure out what the technical issues were on Peter's end and get him on here so you can see his less furry, more clean cut, and uh, what presentable face than mine. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. Watch this space. Peter Lloyd to come. See you later, everybody. See you, Janet. Bye, Dean. Bye.